I'm uh, very happy to be here today and to be able to talk to you about traveling resistance. Uh, I would like to start with a quick look at the use of delousing chemicals in salmonid aquaculture. Modern aquaculture started around 1970, and it took just a few years until the first episodics were reported, both in Norway and in Scotland. And of course, I talk about the salmon louse. So, tools were needed to keep the farm fish healthy. In uh, agriculture, pesticides were used successfully, so we started to adapt these to use in the fish farms. The first compounds used were the organophosphates, and they were used exclusively until the early 1990s. But as reports of reduced effects came in, one started looking for the next compound. Uh, Pyrethroids were introduced in the mid-1990s and soon became the dominating uh, medicinal treatment, uh, also excluding organophosphates. Uh, hydrogen peroxide was used a little, but it did not take long until also pyrethroid uh, resistance was reported. In uh, 1999, D and flubenzerones and amamectin benzoate were introduced and uh, amabectin benzoate became the preferred treatment because you can use it in the feed and it also had a protecting effect uh, several weeks after treatment. But <laughs> it, uh, in less than a decade, uh, resistance to amabectin, amabectin benzoate uh, was found in, in uh, the whole Atlantic. So we used, turned the toolbox upside down and started using old friends. But it, the effect was uh, very short-lived, and yes, sorry. And you were left with the benzerones, and they have limitations on use and effect. So the chemical toolbox was basically empty. And one started to ask, how was it possible that resistance could spread, uh, could emerge and spread so quickly? Uh, attention was turned to the wild salmonids. Could migrating Salmonids be a vector of persistent lice between regions. We know that the sea trout migrate through coastal areas, and the wild Atlantic salmon from both shores of the North Atlantic, they travel into the ocean and meet in the sea around us here. But, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so selection for resistance, it only occurs in the fish farms where they use the pesticides or chemicals. So, the wild salmonids, they are not subject to treatment, so maybe they could be a source of sensitive lice. One could hope. Uh, the identification of the genetic markers of resistance to organophosphates and pyrethroids provided a new tool to ad address these questions. While traditional bioassays only can test a group of live salmon lice for one compound, a PCR test can reveal whether a single louse is resistant to one or more compounds, and best of all, it does not have to be alive when you start a test. Uh, lice that are tested for organophosphate resistance, they will be either um, homozygote resistant, heterozygote resistant, or homozygote sensitive. While lice tested for pyrethroid will be genotyped as either resistant or sensitive, as the trait is maternally inherited. Uh, in order to investigate the presence of resistance in time and space, uh, lice and lice data were collected from throughout the North Atlantic. And we found both the contemporary and archived lice. Uh, given the possibility, possibility to test historical samples, lice that had been collected and used in previous genetical studies were sent for genotyping. These lice were sampled from throughout the North Atlantic between 2000 and 2009. All were from fish farms, except one batch from wild Atlantic salmon caught in Russia. Um, new lice from the North Atlantic were, sam were sampled in 2016 and 17, and where possible, the same regions was, were resampled, but there were also some new locations. Again, most lice were, were sampled from fish farms, except one batch from wild Atlantic salmon from Greenland. We also wanted to zoom in and look in more detail in, at one important aquaculture region, namely Norway, 
And uh, lice from wild Atlantic salmon and sea trout were sampled from nine regions along the Norwegian coast in 2014. Most of the samples from sea trout were sampled from the National Salmon Louse uh, Surveillance Program, while most of the lice from wild Atlantic salmon were collected by a local fishermen conducting licensed bagnet fishery, you can see here. Uh, scale samples were taken to ensure that the fish sampled uh, were not escaped from fish. In order to compare the frequency of resistance between uh, lice from wild host and from farmed host, uh, we were allowed to use the results from Pathogen, and who offer uh, lice genotyping commercially. A radius of 50 kilometers from the sampling po points of the wild salmonids were used to select which farm data to use, and we also cross-checked with available uh, treatment data so that we could exclude farms that uh, had used the relevant compounds within the last four weeks. <clears throat> we were lucky. We were able to take advantage of ongoing research projects and licensed fishery, so our activities did not uh, uh, lead to extra mortality on wild salmonids. And regarding the farm fish, all sampling was done with the consent of the owners, and uh, mostly during routine operations, such as lice counting. All newly sampled lice were preserved in ethanol or RNA later until genotyping. All lice, including the historical samples, were analyzed by Pathogen using their patented Tacman assays for resistance to organophosphates and pyrethroids. A total of 2,286 lice were used successfully genotyped, and we tried to have at least 30 lice from each location and host species. The results of a further uh, 11,000 lice were included in an analysis of the Norwegian lice data. So, I'd, before I start with the results, I just want you to remind you that when you genotype organophosphate resistance, you get either fully resistant, partially resistant, or sensitive lice. And for pyrethroids, you get either resistant or sensitive lice. Uh, later, when I talk about multi-resistance, I mean lice that are resistant to pyrethroids and have at least one resistant allele for organophosphates. Yeah, this map contains a lot of information, um, but I'll try to guide you through the most important results. If we start with looking at organophosphates, we see that resistance to organophosphates is found in throughout the North Atlantic, even in the earliest samples. Um, and remember that organophosphates, they have not been used since the early 1990s around. But still, we find it even in lice sampled from wild Atlantic salmon caught in a Russian river. Um, in a Scottish sample from 2002, there are no sensitive lice at all. So it's tempting to assume that the, the farm where the lice came from had just been treated. But uh, I've checked the data and organophosphates were not used in Scotland in 2002. Um, but when we reached 2016, the samples, organophosphates had used, been used extensively again throughout Europe and Canada. So we, all the places where we have more than one sampling, you see there's a negative trend when it comes to resistance. Uh, if you turn our attention to pyrethroids, these are the resistant colors for pyrethroids. Uh, with the first uh, resistant lice are found in 2009 in Ireland, Shetland, and Norway. And uh, when we come to the most recent samples, you find it throughout Europe, but we don't find it in Canada. And I think that's because of local usage. Uh, while pyrethroids were used extensively in Europe in the late 1990s, and again from 2009 and on onwards, uh, pyrethroids were only allowed for a short period of time in Canada. I think it was 2000, 2001. However, so you don't have a selection pressure there. But if you look at the Greenlandic samples, we find lice that are resistant to Pyrethroids there, and we know that the salmon that is caught off the coast of Greenland, they are both American and European. So it's quite possible that 
respiratory rate resistance has already been brought back to Canada. And we tested 30 lice. <laughs> That's not much. So it's more surprising that we actually find respiratory rate resistance in the wild salmon. Yeah. Um, and yeah. When we're looking at uh, organophosphate resistance and parathyroid resistance together, the formula resistance, we find it everywhere on the, Norwegian, on the European side in the 2016 samples. Uh, and even in areas that have not used either of the chemicals, such, such as Iceland, sorry, Iceland, they didn't start using uh, delancing chemicals until the year, the year after. But still we find multi-resistant lice. And we also find it in the wild hosts. Also, Sörland in Norway is an area with no use of chemicals. And if you look at Norway, in some regions there are significantly <laughs> larger, uh, more multi-resistant lice than sensitive lice. So, if you zoom in on Norway, uh, we could try to compare the frequency of uh, resistance between different hosts within different parts of Norway. And the, the samples from southern Norway, we, we got, regard them as control, because there are basically no farming. There are two or three farms here, and the sea trout is sampled here. So, and also the coastal current goes this way, so it's upstream. And also in Finnmark, at the time of the sampling, uh, it was not very much production there, and the salmon loss was not yet uh, a problem in the farms. So, not much use of delousing chemicals. If you start, start with looking at organophosphates, um, we find resistant alleles in all hosts, in all regions. Um, uh, what I'd like you to notice is the similarity in frequencies between sea trout and farm salmon, where we have those two together. Yeah. And also, if you notice the lice from the wild Atlantic salmon, it's less resistance. So we tested this uh, statistically. And we found that there is um, there's no significant difference between lice sample from sea trout and fish farms. To see there's a line connecting them. We even tried testing different farms, and we see that they're connected. And these two they killed all the sensitive lice, so they yeah. But to see that there's a line everywhere. While the wild Atlantic salmon they are significantly different from both the sea trout and farmed. Uh, salmon host, except in Finnmark and Sörlande and Rogaland, but in the most intensively farmed areas, they differ significantly. And we see the exact same trend for parathyroid resistance. Very similar results for sea trout and farmed salmon in the older areas, and for wild salmon, less. But see, it's even more than Organophosphates still. So the same, we tested it, and there is no significant difference between sea trout and farm salmon at any location. And at all locations except Sörlande and Finnmark, the wild Atlantic salmon is significantly different. When we looked at the results of organophosphates and parathyroids separately, we observed that in some areas there is almost no sensitive lice left. And so it's not surprising that the, the levels of multi-resistance is very high in some areas. Here, sea trout represents the situation in the fjords. But we see that even the returning wild Atlantic salmon have a lot of... Uh, resistance in the lice that they carry back. I think I'll start wrapping up with the last results, last findings first. Uh, we demonstrate that wild sea trout and farm fish within a region share the same pool of lice. 
This means that even if you remove all the farm fish for a period, the sea trout will provide lice with the same level of resistance when the, f the fish is returned to the pens. So if you're thinking about following a fjord to increase sensitivity, <laughs> remember to do it in the winter when there's not so much sea lice. Um, the lower levels of resistant alleles in lice from violet and the salmon is believed to be because of dilution uh, during the ocean stage, where the salmon has picked up lice from non-farming areas. So, returning wild salmon could be a source of sensitive lice, but the entire returning wild sal salmon population of Norway could be fit in one or two fish farms, so the effect is believed to be very little. Our results also demonstrate that the wild salmon is a vector of resistant lice to regions with no aquaculture. After looking at the development and dispersal of res resistance to organophosphates and parathroids, both in time and space in the North Atlantic, we conclude that the salmon louse displays an ability to rapidly adapt and disperse beneficial genes, beneficial for them, genes over large distances. The salmon louse is by nature a dispersing species. The planktonic stages disperse with the water currents and the adults follow their migrating hosts over very large distances. This results in a high degree of connectivity across the North Atlantic. So if you put the louse under selection in one corner of the ocean, it might affect the entire aquaculture industry in the North Atlantic. As Kieran Pritt stressed earlier today, we have to use the delousing tools cleverly in order to maximize their longevity. And that means that an ocean scale management of these species is needed. I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisors and co-authors. And if you want to <laughs> look deeper into this material, here are the links to the publications. I would also like to thank all those who sampled lice for me across the North Atlantic and uh, uh, fishermen and everyone. I think some of you are here. So thank you. <laughs>